Hi, I'm Justin, G0KSC of Innova Antennas and also the G0KSC.co.uk website where a lot of my design work is published or some of my older designs are published for uh, free building yourself. Um, you'll also find some of my work in the ARRL antenna book and also in Dubus magazine. And Dubus magazine in 2021, in the first part, I will be covering uh, the quad Yagis and some of the aspects of what we will discuss today uh, in an article there. So please do take a look at that also. Um, one thing I do need to, to uh, say at the beginning is that this might need to go over into two parts. And the reason for that is at the moment, whilst we have less than a thousand subscribers, YouTube tend to limit the time that you can record for. So it's it's around 15 minutes, just over perhaps, but that's about the best that I can do at the moment uh, before we um, uh, before we go into a position where um, they won't allow it to upload. So rather than having to try and trim that or cut it in half and produce two videos, it may be when it gets to that 15 minute mark that I have to do that. Okay, so what we're going to be talking about is my quad or LFAQ as I've designed it, uh, what the design parameters were and why uh, and where uh, that came from. I've got some notes here as well so I don't have to sort of add quite as many notations hopefully onto the presentation there afterwards. So the first thing really is where did the inspiration come from? was very heavily into uh, optimizing Yagi's and the LFA Yagi, Opdes Yagi and so on which you'll find on some of the previous uh, videos and discussions about. Um, uh, but really the inspiration for this LFAQ, the, the rigid uh, quad, came from YU7XL. Now um, Boban has a website which you can find at uh, QSLnet and uh, he discusses some of the various bits and pieces with regards to his antennas. Uh, and at the bottom here, he has uh, a list or a link where you can go to where he discusses a great deal of the, uh, the antennas in detail. You can click into one of those and have a look at the details or download the details on that um, antenna uh, and perhaps even build yourself. So um, a very nice concept. And if you look, it's uh, using the tubes or, or um, a solid rod that in this case is molded and clamped onto a, a, a boom here um, and then orientated onto a, a, a long single boom. Now that idea is great. The only issue that I have with that is that, is that well in actual fact it's two. The first is that with Easy NEC or NEC based antenna uh, modelers, um, mini neck modelers, um, Managal uh, when you have curved elements, as you do here, uh, that reduces the accuracy of the model. Um, and uh, so what that means is that when you're producing the antenna, it might be that you produce something as long as this, and it's not quite where you need it to be. So you may have to either model it so that it's very wide and lose a little bit of the performance, or um, have to have a few different hits at it. So one of the aspects that I wanted to do was to make these tip lengths adjustable so that on all of those elements, if the antenna didn't sit exactly where you wanted it to be, you could reduce the size of each of those elements or increase the size of each of those elements all by the same percentage. So you could sit that antenna exactly where you wanted it to be. The problem is with that is that when you were to then secure these element tips, maybe with a hose clamp or something like that, um, it would mean that these could easily fold over. So what I produced is the LFAQ, which would then have um, twin booms, and we can see a, a first picture of one of those here. Uh, this is a, a 144 megahertz version, and as you can see it has twin booms, in this case they're three quarter inch. This means that you can just use a single through the boom um, U-bolt on each side and then uh, the elements pass through the top and the bottom. Now there is a break at the bottom on the driven element so that you can feed it and there's an insulator that runs through the boom so that the coax feeds either side of the boom. But as far as electrically connecting at the top, that's fine. At the design frequency that isn't seen. 
So you've got the RF that travels around here, hits this point, that's a point of theoretical zero current, come back again, just voltage, pick up the current, go backwards and forwards. So we're going backwards and forwards, each side, just like this. Uh, so at the design frequency, that isn't seen. That helps uh, to remove uh, the any static buildup that can drain away and protect the, uh, the transceiver. And also, uh, although it's not seen at the design frequency, it does mean that the antenna goes uh, high impedance very, very quickly. So you have a, a bandpass filter that's, or bandpass filter property that's added to the antenna too. So that's uh, where it's at. You can see then there's just a, a single small bolt that's needed to heat old, each of these to the elements here. Uh, and then the end sections, uh, there are loops here um, with slide in trombone sections like they are on the LFA Yagi, uh, which means that you can adjust every one of them by the same percentage to get exactly where you want to be with that particular antenna. So, uh, you know, it could be the case that if you wanted to, you could um, weld those points once you're done or spot weld because there is the aluminium brazing which you can use now with a hot torch uh, and just simply effectively solder each of those joints and you're good to go. The other associated benefits with doing that is uh, as well, I'm just looking at my notes here to make sure I don't miss anything. Uh, this is obviously fairly simple to, um, to maintain. But when you have um, traditional quads they're generally made with thin wires. Now, one of the benefits of the quad, of course, is that per foot of boom, it can be higher than a Yagi over a given, if, if the Yagi and the quad have got the same bandwidth uh, associated with them, then of course, uh, it, it can be that there's a higher gain figure. That does diminish, and I'll show you in a, a second why. Um, but with the radiating element or the elements themselves, the thinner they are, the less gain there is. It's very slight, but the bigger the element, generally the more gain that can be achieved. So of course, when you have a quad which lends itself to higher gain, and then you use thin wires, you're reducing potentially what gain you could be having. So when you now get to, and we can do these on HF, um, but when you get these to VHF, on your, and you're now using half inch elements with, three eighth inch end sections which is a almost 13 millimeters uh, by 10 millimeters if you look at the ends then the potential gain is much much higher uh, and that also uh, helps to broadband the antenna as well so what else was there um, we spoke about the gain part um, obviously it's strong and stable and if you've got a, a fairly good bandwidth which is easy to achieve with these especially with the larger diameter elements uh, then it becomes very stable as well. So if you imagine you had something like this in a very, very icy location, um, that can be loaded with ice and it, it wouldn't be troubled at all. It's going to stay fairly rigid as well. Uh, and the other aspect is, is that you can handle very, very high levels of power. Now, I'm just going to open up a slide which I delivered in a presentation. Um, and I'm doing this rather than bringing them in later because it, it feels more fluid if I if I do these rather than overlay these in the presentation later on. Um, the 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 quad itself was first introduced and developed by uh, Clarence Moore W9LZX or W9LZX for our European friends. Um, and the reason that he developed the quad was to help remove some of the higher altitude. Um, uh, issues that he had where he was operating with the antennas on a commercial station and coronial discharge which you can see here on this electricity cable uh, when you get very high power and that happens on a Yagi it happens at the tips of the elements and ultimately what that means is that the element tips can melt and fall away and then of course your antenna is no longer um, uh, effective a frequency of operation will be on the band where you were, were using it, it because of course <laughs> the elements would be uh, becoming shorter. So with the closed loop then uh, there isn't any tip that, that, can, that, that can be uh, subject to that uh, highest levels of coronial discharge so you don't have the, um, the melting aspect that could uh, occur as a result. So um, that was the, the, the main reason um, for the introduction of the, the quad but of course it has other associated disadvantages. If you look at the quad in the way that I've produced it with the twin booms and with the quad elements, the quad's elements are 
plus or minus depending on where you are in the array um, a wavelength long whereas the Yagi elements are a half wave long so when you're using tubes you've now got twice as much tube per element as you would have with uh, an equivalent Yagi you also have two booms rather than the one boom of the Yagi so it gets to a point where does the performance that you're achieving outweigh what you're putting in so I'm going to bring up another um, slide which I made here earlier uh, to show you to which is very very basic but it's to give you um, an indication as to where uh, we are as far as that performance benefit is now commercially through Innova antennas we make uh, the LFAQ up to around seven elements and people on occasion say well could you do me one longer could it be uh, 9 10 12 or, or whatever it is but I, I have a, a point of view with that and one of the problems for me is that um, I said early on that I wouldn't produce anything commercially that I wouldn't be happy with using myself even if the the market demands it it's like the 2 meter 70 sems Yagi's on the same boom you know, they're, they're third harmonic related so if you're feeding with a single feed point the two meter elements are going to conduct when 70 sems is in use uh, which is going to flower petal the pattern on 70 sems so yes you can get a good SWR but you're not going to get the same performance as you would do with other dual band Yagi's where you don't have that third harmonic relationship issue so it's a similar situation here if you look at this scale here we've got an effective gain per foot of boom in the vertical plane and then the number of elements that you might have on a Yagi or a quad so you can see when you've got a two element a two element quad or a two element Yagi the difference that you would have in gain between the two is at its greatest as the boom gets longer that delta that difference between the gain between the Yagi and the quad starts to become closer together now for me when you get up to sort of seven elements the the difference when you have and and you can make the, the gain much bigger if, if you wanted to but you're going to have narrow band what I'm talking about is comparisons between a Yagi and a quad which have similar bandwidth so let's say 14 to 14.35 megahertz um, under say 1.2 to 1 so that Yagi and that quad both have 1.2 to 1 from 14. Uh, 0 to 14.35 that delta between those two points for the additional hardware the additional weight which is is getting on for twice the amount in the quad doesn't warrant the difference in performance because after all if I had the vertical space I could then stack two of those Yagi's one above the other and have a greater performance than that single uh, quad okay so that's where we are uh, on on the quads and why I tend not to go uh, too long with these the other great benefit with the quads is the ability to be able to stack now um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up uh, an easy neck version of the antenna and I'm watching the time because we're already up to 13 um, if you haven't got viewing or, or any basic knowledge of easy neck or some of the other modeling packages this is available through uh, easyneck.com there is a free version or you can buy and support the developer uh, the the simple version and see some of these in their fullness and I will give some downloads to some of these models which you can have a look at these will be presented on the screen now and they'll be staying on my site for you to be able to download uh, and play with now this is the a, a very short two element quad um, and it's a direct 50 ohm feed point one of the things with the uh, older style quads is always tended to be around 110 112 ohm now I've come to the conclusion that the reason that it was optimized around that figure is you can use a quarter wave length of 75 ohm piece of quarter wave length coax with 50 ohm coax at the end of it that will give you a 50 ohm match at the end of that 75 ohm length of coax but it needs to be having the considerations of the um, velocity factor of the cable so you need to measure that to make sure it's okay um, but the problem with that is of course you reduce the power capabilities of the antenna you need to get it right uh, the, the the sizes that's involved for the coax 
Um, and with a, a 50 ohm direct feed, generally you can have a shorter boom with a similar amount of gain, perhaps in some cases better amount of gain per foot of boom. Once you get up to VHF and UHF, getting those lengths of the coax correct uh, and also the power handling starts to become a bit more of an issue. And obviously it's a great deal simpler to be able to feed a, a, a quad with a 50 ohm coax and just have to worry about a few ferret cores or a, a simple choke to stop coax radiation. So when you look at this one, this is for two meters, 144 megahertz. And if I do the run here, uh, you can see it gives 6.74 dBi, 16 and a half dB of front to back. Uh, so it's pretty reasonable. Um, and when you look at the, the boom length, it's just 14 centimeters long. I mean, it's, it's very, very short indeed. Uh, and the reason it's that length is we have to come in that amount to keep the impedance fairly low. I'm going to need to chop this here and I'll carry on in part two in just a few seconds.